Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really happy to have with me once again Jeff Deist, who served uh, Congressman Ron Paul as his chief of staff, and Daniel and Daniel McAdams, who served uh, Dr. Paul as his foreign affairs dev- advisor while Dr. Paul was still a, a congressman. Um, and so it's uh, both men were there with Congressman Paul when he ran for president, and I guess that was back in 2012 or so. Jeff is currently the president of the Mises Institute, and Daniel works directly every day with Dr. Paul at the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. And you can check out Jeff's work and the work of the Mises Institute at Mises.org, and uh, you can follow uh, you can follow the work of Dr. Paul and uh, as well as Daniel at the uh, Ron Paul Institute, RonPaulInstitute.org. Uh, so welcome, both of you, to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. Thanks for joining me again. Um, I would like to ask uh, both of you, uh, perhaps, just just um, put in a little plug for your respective institutions, starting with you, Jeff. Talk about the Mises Institute and what you're trying to do, and then, Daniel, follow up with the Ron Paul Institute. Take a couple of minutes, uh, both of you, to, to just to tell our listeners what you're doing and what the purpose of your institutions uh, is. Jay, I, you know, it seems like we live in such an anti-intellectual age, and the, the truth is that ideas still matter, or the lack of ideas still matter, and the Mises Institute has always been about trying to provide an education in economics, what we would consider real or correct or proper economics, mostly of the Austrian variety, uh, to people at little or no cost, and to really doing an end run around academia and the academic establishment, uh, trying to make uh, a thorough grounding in, in econ available to people uh, of all stripes, of all walks of life, because it's so important. It informs everything about us. And, and, and as you know, econ has become this mathy discipline when, in fact, it's, it's a, a subset of all human action. So the Mises Institute is really here uh, to educate and hopefully even inspire the layperson to uh, stop believing the nonsense uh, that we get from the mainstream. All right, Daniel. Uh Ron Paul Institute, what are you up to? Well, we've, <clears throat> excuse me, we've been around for, uh, you know, I guess uh, going on almost four years now. And, you know, our, our, our mission is to continue Dr. Paul's work in the area primarily of foreign affairs, foreign policy, and civil liberties. But obviously there's a, there's, there's a lot of overlap with, with what Mises does with economics, with Austrian economics, with central banking, with the Fed. Uh, so you can't really sequester too much. Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, we, we certainly we find in the era of Trump now that there's much more to do. There, there's much more uh, room for, for commentary. This sclerosis of the Obama administration is gone. And we find that our influence is increasing. And, we, you know, we, we run a highly curated website with new articles daily. And we, we write a lot of our own articles. And Dr. Paul and I do a daily Ron Paul Liberty Report, which is live at YouTube, uh, every weekday at noon Eastern time, uh, mm-hmm. and our audience is growing there. We have we've had about six million people watch our show, which is great. And we're getting close to eighty thousand subscribers. So, uh, you know, our job is to is talk to the informed layman uh, and and tell them that there is an alternative to fake news. <laughs> no, what I think you have been labeled fake news, Daniel. We have, and it's a label we we wear proudly. Yeah, David Stockman <laughs> said the same, and I've had him on the show. He was named as a faker as well. Has uh, Mises uh, earned that reputation yet, Jeff, or are you still working on it? Or you don't well, want to have it? <laughs> no, I, I think we're still working on it. But the, 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 what's interesting here is this idea that any news is not filtered or aimed at uh, persuading as opposed to just reporting. It's sure. it's, a, it's a loaded term. But I, I'm glad the term has, has come to life because we don't have to all sit here and pretend that Walter Cronkite is the voice of God anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Uh, good point. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit about this Trump administration. Jeff, uh, I would like to ask you first. We have heard a lot of scorn from the mainstream media concerning Steve Bannon, uh, who some are crediting as the brains behind Donald Trump. To what extent do you think that's true? And then maybe have some of your thoughts on, on Steve Bannon. Well, not being an insider, I can't tell you how much he has Trump's ear. Um, I was listening to Victor Davis Hanson, who's sort of a right-wing guy with the Hoover Institution, writes a little bit for National Review the other night, and uh, I view Hanson as a very intelligent man, and, and he opined from his own knowledge that Bannon is a very, very bright guy, so I'm not going to doubt that or dispute that, 
Um, I did watch his movie when he left Goldman Sachs. He went out to California and and produced a, made a, a private equity company that produced some right wing movies. One of them was called Generation Zero, which mm. is available for free on YouTube, and it really gives a, an excellent portrayal of Bannon's that uh, admittedly dark worldview. It's based on a concept in a book called The Fourth Turning. Uh, and, and look, I don't care if anybody has uh, a dark worldview with respect to government and what government can do, but but my problem with Bannon is that I don't think he understands the central issue of our day, which is the same one as always, uh, progressivism versus real liberalism. Uh. It was pro- progressive statism, the, the idea that government can perfect man and control man versus liberalism, which is the, the notion that man should be left free to, to his own devices with some sort of uh, common law restraints. And, and there's no sense or feeling of that basic power versus liberty struggle in his movie. Instead, it's this kind of darkish uh, uh, m- film about nationalism versus the left. And, and while I certainly share his uh, disregard for the left, which has become an absolute force of evil uh, in the West, uh, I-, I found the movie less than compelling. I found it dull. I found it facile. Um, so... He, he may indeed be brilliant, but from my perspective anyway, the, the film Generation Zero didn't really reflect that. Yeah. Any comments, Daniel? Yeah, I, On Steve Bannon? Me, I, had the same reaction. I had the same reaction as Jeff. You know, it was recommended to me as a movie that had libertarian principles uh, throughout it, uh, but everyone mm-hmm. that was interviewed was a neocon. And, ah. you know, it's, it's, it's you know, uh, when I see John Bolton up there talking about uh, foreign policy, I'm going to turn it off. And I think that's that's what's missing in the Bannon worldview is, is the idea of what America's place in the world is and the idea of restraint. And he doesn't have it. He has a messianic view, from what I can tell, uh, from the movie that's not dissimilar from the neocon. So I, I found it quite boring, too. I, I, I you know, nearly nearly fell asleep. And I think and, and I think Lou Rockwell or the Mises Institute, I think it was Lou Rockwell, Put up a great quote from uh, uh, from Murray Rothbard on this whole idea of these predetermined uh, 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 chunks of history. You know that this follows this and that follows that. And I encourage people to look up what what, what they put up because I, I really reject this idea that that history is predetermined. It's it's uh, it's something that I find an asthma. Yeah, as if we don't have any free choice. Huh? As if countries can't uh, take a different direction. Um, well, yeah. I guess that's, that's, that's something we're never going to really – well, it, it certainly seems to me that if he's surrounding himself with neocons, and, and, I, and I agree that some of the people that you just named uh, that are now seemingly very much a part of the administration uh, you know, are certainly problematic from a libertarian's point of view, I would think. Uh, but Bannon's speech the other day at CPAC, he talked about – or his little discussion there, uh, he, he talked about three basic – uh, ideas of the Trump administration and the Trump Trumpism, uh, I guess that he espoused a lot during the campaign. The three were national security, economic nationalism, and deconstruction of the administrative state. Uh, I would like to ask you, Jeff, to the extent you understand what he's talking about there. Do, are, are there any of those ideas? I mean, certainly, uh, deconstruction of the administration state, I would think, would be one that libertarians could be pleased with, but. Would you comment just in general with with respect to his his three basic ideals of of the Trump administration? Well, national security is a bit of a canard as an expression. It's kind of like social justice, undefined and undefinable. Yep. And of course, we know that real national security comes from not stirring up hornets' nets abroad, yeah, uh, and demilitarizing and depoliticizing conflict all around the globe. And, and if Hans Hermann Hoppe is to believe, national security is basically a myth that uh, mil- vast militaries and armies and uh, defense apparatus provide no real benefit at all. Uh, you know, economic nationalism, I think we'll get into that, uh, or I hope we get into that during this discussion. But, um, you know, it's a, another uh, b- bit of a r- red herring. Um, it's something where a true America first trade policy is very simple. Uh, mm-hmm. You make it easier for poor people in America to buy cheap imported stuff at Walmart. I yeah. mean, let's let's be frank that relatively free or, or freer trade than existed in the past has been one of the huge uh, factors in making less affluent people in America better off over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, so 
um, you know, a, a slapping a tax on people to buy something from another country is, is, is never the solution. Now, the administrative state, that's a discussion we could have for hours and hours, and, and that's uh, obviously uh, something that needs to be done. It, it's obviously an enormous problem in America, but uh, it, it's so entrenched, the administrative uh, bureaucracies uh, don't come and go for the most part with presidents. It's only the, the leadership at the very top, the secretaries and agency appointees. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's 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 a very, very difficult task. And when we talk about the deep state and we talk about interests, especially interests that contract with the federal government on one, on one level, um, you, you want to talk about a group of self-interested people who do not want to see the administrative state deconstructed. Um, boy, I... I uh, I wouldn't want to be the president who has to back up that promise. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's a promise he's made, so it's, it's going to be quite interesting uh, to see how that works. I remember, Jeff, one time you talking about each of these major branches of government, these, these uh, not branches of government, but bureaucracies, are enormous entities in their own right, and to try to stop them is almost impossible, right? Well, it, you know, there's there are federal employee unions which are very powerful. So there's legal mechanisms and potentially judicial uh, roadblocks to anything Trump would want to do. Uh, and there's still we don't hear much about it, but there still is this little thing called Congress, which in, in theory is supposed to be passing laws. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing where Trump has made promises almost in the form of boasts, mm-hmm. almost like. A businessman saying, "My new golf course resort is going to be the greatest thing you ever saw," and it, it's a, it's, you know, he comes from a world where he really ruled and controlled. Yes, uh, uh, his employees, and he's going to find this Washington a, a world very hostile to to himself. Yeah, I mean, he he can uh, issue executive orders to an extent, I guess, but how is that going to go down, and how is it going to work? It's uh, it's it's going to be fascinating to watch, I guess, from to the extent we're able to see it. Um, all right, let's, so let's, uh, <coughs> uh, Daniel, with respect to national security, uh, you know, some of the ideas here is the setting up the wall and immigration, trying to keep people out. Um, of course, in the meantime, what's Trump's policy looking like overseas with respect to the military? He talked a lot during the campaign about we shouldn't be involved in all these different places, and I said, yeah, that's, that's something I agree with, and I was pretty happy about that. But as you were pointing out, he seems to be bringing in a lot of neocons that certainly don't want to back away from, a, from a, an aggressive military interference overseas. So is it possible to have, you know, to set up walls to keep immigrants out uh, and, and have a, a safe domestic uh, environment uh, if we're still stirring up the hornet's nest overseas, Daniel? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. In, in some ways, I, I can't completely fault him for surrounding himself by neocons because, unfortunately, even if he wanted to reach out to a different cadre of foreign affairs experts, where are they? Um, you know, who would he reach to? Uh, the big names that you're supposed to have in your administration have all made their careers by advising uh, that we do more overseas. Uh, the more that you do, the more that you advise overseas, the more that your think tank uh, gets donated to from, uh, you know, companies associated with the military industrial complex. It's sort of an evil relationship they have inside the beltway. So even if he really wanted to, if they find me some people that are outside this, it would be very difficult. People go into foreign affairs because they want more of it, uh, just like they do in other fields. They go into education because they want more of it. So that's a fundamental uh, problem that he has to face. And when you couple that with the fact that he really is lacking in ideology, he does not have a philosophy of America's place in the rest of the world, other than, as Jeff pointed out, the sort of boastful idea. <clears throat> so those, things together, those two things together, I think, put him into a corner. What can he do? He rightly pointed out at CPAC that we've wasted $6 trillion in the Middle East and that the presidents would have been better off just to go to the beach for the past 15 years. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that was a great point. But then he went on, and Dr. Paul pointed this out in his column this week. He went on a couple of minutes later saying, I promise you the greatest military buildup in history, which shows that he either either has two speechwriters that hate each other, and they're just playing games, 
or he's not really paying attention to what he's saying. You can't have both of these at the same time. So it's, it really is, unfortunately, the inertia of the foreign policy establishment. And I suspect a president who's pretty unschooled in the finer points of foreign policy and who lacks a lot of curiosity uh, in that area. Mm-hmm. Well, there was a very interesting article that I just read, uh, the three Trump administrations, and they pointed out the sort of the division within the Trump administration. Uh, you have some of those people that are very, very close to, to Donald Trump himself, uh, and then you have some of the others uh, you know, that, that are sort of in the middle, but then you have the third administration, which is uh, you know, people – uh, sort of a combination of George W. Bush, Ronald Reagan administration, neoconservatives, activists. I think he linked uh, in there, the article linked in the Secretary of State. Uh, and, and so it seems like uh, what you're saying is it's a very divided administration. And you wonder how much, um, you really wonder how much, um, you know, which way this thing is going to go. But it would seem to me that the state is so much more powerful than uh, then the executive, and especially, I mean, unlike Dr. Paul, who you two worked with, uh, Trump doesn't really seem to have an ideology or, or, or a direction to go. So it, it really, you have to wonder. Jeff, I'd like to ask you, getting back to this point of economic nationalism, uh, you know, it, it seems, I mean, one of the points that Tucker Carlson has made recently with respect to the middle class, you know, he's arguing in favor of uh, of a stricter control of immigrants coming in. Uh, and their, the, the prices, the wages would go up for the work that the immigrants are doing, and that would provide middle America, people that don't have work, with something to do. They're not willing to work at these wages, but they would work for higher wages if, they, if the market were allowed to, uh, to develop in that way. In other words, keep, keep them out, do what Donald Trump would do or, or what he seems to want to do, um, and then you would have inflation, things would cost more, but – at least the middle class would have some higher wages. What are your thoughts along those lines? Yeah, I think it's uh, wrong, first and foremost, especially with regard to farm work. Um, Most Americans who didn't grow up doing farm work, I think, have very, very little capacity at any wage uh, to do what Mexican immigrant laborers do in the U.S. Southwest on a daily basis, which is backbreaking work in the sun. Uh, f- for low pay, so I, you know, I, I understand the sentiment. Uh, the the challenge for those of us who believe in trade is always to take things a step further. In other words, uh, it's the seen and the unseen that mm-hmm. Bastiat described in his book. So anyone can say, well, if these Mexicans are coming in taking these jobs, and we stop the Mexicans from coming in taking these jobs, and the jobs will go to Americans. So it's this sort of simple little syllogism. Um, but you have to go a step further and say, well, uh, you know, there's there's a welfare state. Uh, there are jobs that Americans are unwilling to do. Um, there are there's supply and demand for labor, just like there's supply and demand for I- any other any good or service. So, um, you know, the the economic nationalism is is really a way of looking at the world, uh, not as it works, but as one wishes it works. So mm-hmm. I, I think that uh, this fetish that the Trump administration and protectionists have for exports, this idea that exports are always to be applauded and subsidized and promoted, but cheap imports are ever and always a bad thing that are driving uh, wages down in America. It, it, it's very strange. It doesn't fit with the facts of the of the 20th century, and, and it just doesn't uh, fit with economic theory. It's good to have a trade deficit when what we're trading is rapidly depreciating U.S. dollars yeah. for actual <laughs> stuff. Um, mm-hmm. I, I know it's a cliche, but you've probably heard the saying that you have a trade deficit with your local grocer, and that's a good thing. You give him mm-hmm. or her money, and they give you food to eat. So, uh, You know, it's the same old uh, protectionist arguments that we've keep beating down and keep defeating both conceptually in theory and in terms of history and empiricism and practice. And they just keep cropping up. So there's there's clearly uh, something in human nature that makes us want to uh, take what appears to be the easy solution. Yeah, for sure. Well, we only have a couple of minutes left. Daniel, could you what, what do you expect from the president this evening in front of Congress? What, what do you expect he'll say? Well, I think he'll say what he's, what he's been saying. You know, we're going to do great things. We're going to 
We're going to rebuild the military. Uh, we're going to uh, have a massive infrastructure programs. I think he wants to spend a trillion dollars. He wants to spend another. He's going to spend another trillion upgrading the nuclear weapons. Uh, and he's going to give everyone a tax cut. And um, you know, rainbow unicorns are going to fly through the Capitol building. You know, yeah. it's. Uh, I wish all of these things could happen. Well, I don't wish they could happen, but. But what is he going to do with the, to the currency to make these things happen? It's just very unrealistic. He's in a trap. He's put himself in a trap uh, by promising everything to everyone. And I think it's, um, you know, I think this stick is going to get old fairly quickly, unfortunately. And I think we're heading down the road to some serious economic day of reckoning. Yeah, and indeed. Jeff, with 30 seconds left, we've got a $20 trillion budget that has to be voted on very shortly, uh, a ceiling that has to be lifted beyond that. Uh, how is this going to shake out? <laughs> well, I suspect that they'll pass it. But look, I got a solution for them. Take the about 2.5 to 2.8 trillion of U.S. Treasury debt that the Fed owns right now, upon which it remits interest payments back to the Treasury, and just yeah. cancel it. You got 2.5 trillion of of new uh, breathing room right there. Just get rid of it. We owe it to ourselves, as they say. Right. Good idea. Look. What's the chance of it being implemented, though, with the bankers in charge? I doubt it. But thank you very much, both of you, for being with us today. Sorry we don't have more time. I had loads and loads more questions another time, perhaps. 